Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the audio conference call for Embraer's financial results for the third quarter of 2023. Thank you for standing by. The numbers of this presentation contain non-gap financial information to facilitate investors to reconcile EVA's financial information in GAAP standard to Embraer's IFRS. We remind that EVA's results will be discussed on EVA's conference. It is important to mention that all numbers are presented in US dollar as it is our functional currency. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Instructions to participate will be given at the time. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. This conference call includes forward-looking statements or statements about events or circumstances which have not occurred. Embraer has based these forward-looking statements largely on its current expectations and projections about future events and financial trends affecting the business and its future financial performance. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks, uncertainties, and assumptions including, among other things, general economic, political, and business conditions in Brazil and in other markets where the company is present. The words believes, may, will, estimates, continues, anticipates, intends, expects, and similar words are intended to identify forward-looking statements. Embraer undertakes no obligations to update, publicly revise any forward-looking statements because of new information, future events, and other factors. In light of these risks and uncertainties, the forward-looking events and circumstances discussed on this conference call might not occur. The company's actual results could differ substantially from those anticipated in the forward-looking statements. Participants on today's conference call are Francisco Gomes Neto, President and CEO, Antonio Carlos Garcia, Chief Financial Officer, and Leonardo Shinohara, Director of Investor Relations. I would like now to turn the conference over to Francisco, who will proceed with the first remarks. Please go ahead. Good morning, and thank you all for joining our third quarter 2023 results conference call today. Firm order backlog ended at 17.8 billion, a 500 million increase versus the second quarter, with 42 commercial aircraft sold by September. This quarter was marked by an excellent sales momentum and double digit revenue growth in all business units. EBIT and free cash flow are in line with our expectations. We concluded our reliability management process, placing Embraer in an excellent cash position with the extension of our debt maturity with no relevant disimbursement until mid-2027. On the other hand, we are still facing some challenges in our supply chain. And Embraer has been diligently working with its suppliers to mitigate these issues. Our operational and financial guidance for the year remain unchanged. On the next slides, we present the highlights of our business units. Commercial aviation delivered a total of 39 aircraft during 2023, of which 21 are E2, three times more than the same period in 2022. Commercial aviation backlog rose to 8.6 billion compared to the second quarter 2023, with a book to bill of one to one, highlighting sales stability in deliveries this year. It is also important to mention that there are many ongoing sales campaigns. In the US market, we had several firm orders coming from main customers of E-175 U-1 jets. This is an important highlight because it shows that the pilot shortage situation is improving in the US. Another important deal was with Luxembourg-based airline, 
Luxair. The E-185E2 aircraft will complement Luxair's narrowbody fleet. In its active aviation, revenue increased 25% year over year, and EBIT margin improved 2.1%. The business unit delivered 28 jets, representing an increase of five aircraft compared to Q3 2022. The business continues its outstanding performance with sustained demand across its entire product portfolio and a strong customer acceptance in both retail and fleet markets. Backlog grew 10% year over year, reaching 4.3 billion in a book to bill of 1.5 to 1. In defense, Austria and Czech Republic announced the selection of the C-390 Millennium as their tactical military transport aircraft. Last year, Netherlands had also announced the selection of the C-390, which consolidates the multi-mission platform as a preferred solution in NATO countries. These potential contracts represent a new phase for defense and a significant growth potential for our backlog. In October, the first Portuguese Air Force KC-390 has entered into service. This is the first KC-390 to enter into service outside Brazil. Also in October, we celebrated with the Brazilian Air Force the KC-390 milestone of 10,000 flight hours, attesting the aircraft's remarkable performance in its versatility and capacity in different areas of operation. Finally, the year-to-date EBIT margin defense is 7.2%, and the quarter margin improvement occurred due to contract adjustments for the KC-390 and the physical progress of the program. We emphasize that these adjustments were punctual, and for the next quarter, we expect business margin to normalize. In service and support, our revenue has increased by 24% year over year to 366 million. We recorded a consistent double digit EBIT margin year to date. Another highlight was the backlog increase of 2.8 billion in the quarter, the highest value ever recorded in this business unit. Embraer service and support has reinforced its role as one of the main drivers of growth for the next years. I will now hand it over to Antonio to give you further details on the financial results, and we'll be back with closing remarks. Thank you, Francisco, and good morning, everyone. Indeed, we have an excellent quarter with financial and operational indicators aligned with our projections for 2023. Moving to slide seven, we have good news about deliveries. In the third quarter, Embraer delivered 43 jets, 15 commercial and 28 executive, representing an increase of 30% compared to the same period last year and 33% higher year to date. The highlight is commercial aviation, representing a robust growth with Deliveries rising from 10 to 15, an increase of 50% on year-over-year -year basis. In executive aviation, deliveries also increased in the quarter. 19 light and 9 mid-sized jets, 22% higher than third quarter 22. We have a challenge ahead of us in Q4 deliveries, but as we already demonstrated last year, we are prepared for this. As a result, we are confirming the delivery outlook in our commercial and executive business for 2023. Slide 8 backlog. Our firm or backlog ended the quarter at 17.8 billion, the highest backlog in one year. The quality of orders in our backlog is accurate with Embraer's profitability expectation. In commercial aviation, total backlog increased from 
271 aircrafts to 291 aircrafts quarter over quarter. In executive aviation, we see a resilient backlog with an annual book to bill of 1.5 to 1, one of the highest in the industry currently. The business continues to experience a strong growth with a solid demand for the entire portfolio. Service and support backlog reached its record, reflecting the extension and increase in the pool parts per contracts. As a result of our excellent performance, we ended the quarter with approximately 1.3 billion of net revenue, 38% higher year over year. Revenue year to date exceeded 3 billion, which represents a figure of 29% higher year over year. We had an increase in revenue in all of our business units, which shows Embraer potential for a sustainable growth. In slide nine, the third quarter, we had an excellent performance in terms of adjusted EBIT and EBITDA with 100 million and 149 million respectively. Adjusted EBIT and EBITDA margins of 7.8% and 11.6 respectively, also shows strong growth, mainly due to the higher revenue in all business units and stable cost base. We are reaffirming our adjusted EBIT and EBITDA margin projections for 2023. Slide 10, we had the free cash flow generation excluding EVE of 44 million in the third quarter, significantly higher year over year with a stable working capital. This upward trend indicates a substantial positive cash generation for the next quarter, in line with higher deliveries, so we are very confident that we will reach the free cash flow guidance of 150 million or more. Moving to investments, 45 million were allocated to R&D and 30 million to CapEx resulting in 75 million investing in the third quarter. Capital allocation is focused on the segments with higher returns, with project search expansion of our production capacity in executive aviation and service and support. Some words about EVE. The program has reached the necessary milestones to begin capitalizing its product development costs on IFRS rules. Adjusted net results were 33 million, an increase of 34% compared to third quarter 22. Reported net income was positively impacted by non-cash mark-to-market of EV warrants of 24 million on an adjusted net margin of 2.6% remaining stable compared to the third quarter 22. Slide 11. In this slide, we are pleased to show the results of our liability management plan. We reduced our debts in 632 million compared to the second quarter 23. We increased the average debt maturity to 4.8 years, leaving Embraer in a comfortable position where liquidity of 2.4 billion with if allow us to cover all obligations until 2030. In the quarter, our net debt, excluding EVE, is $1,357,000,000, as shown in the top center of the slide. This is a slide lower than last quarter due to the better cash generation. Our leverage ratio shown in the top right corner is 2.5 times, a significant improvement compared to 4.8 times in the same period of last year. It's important to highlight that the positive results of our business unit allowed us to successfully execute our liability management plan. We are taking all necessary steps to recover the investment rate status. With that, I conclude my presentation and hand it back to Francisco for his final remarks. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Antonio. The Q3 results were very satisfactory and met our expectations. Our products are experiencing a very favorable moment in the market, with several important campaigns ongoing, 
in aircraft slots on the production lines practically filled until 2025. We know we have a challenge ahead in terms of deliveries. Therefore, we can expect an intense Q4, mainly due to supply chain constraints. In line with our guidance, we expect 20% revenue growth this year compared to last year. We are confident that this is the harvesting time for everything we have done in recent years and that we are on the right path to a sustainable growth with even more robust financial results in this and future years. Thanks again for your interest and confidence in our company. We will now start the question and answer session. We ask who is interested in asking questions that any time press star 1. Way to be called and when your name is announced, make sure your microphone is on and start your question. To remove your question from the queue, press star 2. Participants connected through the webcast platform may post their questions via chat in the question bar. If you wish to make your questions by voice, you have the option to connect by phone or open your audio crashing the button below the video and slide screen. Our first question comes from Noah Puponek, Goldman Sachs. Please proceed. Hey, good morning, everyone. Morning, Noah. Just on um, demand and commercial, um, it's been a few quarters now that you've been discussing pretty heavy campaigning activity, um, but it's also been a few quarters in a row where the actual signed orders have been relatively tepid. Um, is there something holding those discussions back or making them take longer than expected, or is it really sort of more normal course of order? And, um, you know, I guess what do you think can happen before year end versus maybe what orders look like in 2024? Hi, Noah. Francisco speaking. Thanks for the question. Well, uh, actually, it's, yes, it's take a little longer than we expected, but uh, the, the, we, we, we were working many, in many sales campaigns, so we, we expect uh, to close uh, some deals still in Q4 this year and see a, a book to bill, no, above one to one. So it's one to one in the Q3, but we expect to be above one to one until the end of the year. Okay. And um, just as a follow up, the margin in the segment has been, you know, somewhat volatile, I guess, quarter to quarter and below where you want it to be longer term. Um, how, how should we think about how that margin progresses into next year? Does pricing in the backlog improve enough, quickly enough for that margin to um, have a, a decent amount of expansion next year? Or is the margin, you've talked about that segment getting to longer term, is that uh, further out than next year? Well, I'm Tony speaking here. Thanks for the question. Uh, in regards to the BIT margin for the segments, we, we do see this year a lower single digit. Um, moving to the next year, a little bit better, I would say, it's still lower single digit, but something like three to 4%. What you see in long term, what we are promising to the market without services, a mid single digit margin for the long term. That's more or less what we are seeing right now, uh, highly driven by the aggression of fixed costs and I would say the price point is not moving up as we would expect because we are very active in the E2 campaigns. I'd say which has much more pressure on the, on the price point. But I'd say normalize mid single digit for the long term. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank I appreciate it. Thank you. Our next question comes from Kevin Rumor TV. Please proceed. Thank you very much and uh, good results. So maybe talk a little bit about the order mix. It looks like you, you know you did particularly well on the 175. 
the margins were pretty good, even though there were fewer 175s. I know the mix has favored the 175 as much more profitable. Can you discuss first what the outlook is for 175 orders as a percent of the total going forward, what the mix is likely to be next year, 175 versus E2, and how the E2 is doing in terms of profitability? Hello, Kai. Well, I mean, uh, the participation of E2 is growing as we expected. So we, we, for the following years, we expect, you know, to be 60, 40, 60% 60 E2s and still 40% E1s, which we believe is a, it's a healthy mix for the commercial aviation, considering the margins, as, as you mentioned before. Okay, and then, um, you know, you've done well in terms of KC390 selections. Uh, when should we expect the orders? How big would you expect the orders to be? And what should we look for in terms of delivery prognosis going forward? Oh. Well, I mean, uh, we, we, we saw the announcement of Netherlands in 2022 for five KCs, and uh, more recently from Austria and, and Czech Republic. So as Austria, I mean, also announced that they want to join Netherlands in, this, uh, in the same contract. We expect to close you know, those contracts by, you know, the beginning of 2024. And they are, they'll be very important. It's a very important moment for our defense business. With, with those contracts, we'll be able to more than double the backlog of defense, which will be very important for the performance of the, the business unit. And we are still working in other, in other campaigns. You know, we are expecting a decision from South Korea, you know, for still for this year, in a, in a bid, we are participating. So, and, and many other, other campaigns as well. So, we, we, we believe it is a good moment for defense. When you said you have five for the Netherlands, how many would that total be when Austria joins and when Czech joins? Any, any sense in terms of the size of the South Korean order and, and you know, what's the expected build in terms of deliveries? Well, if you combine if you combine Netherlands, Austria, and Czech Republic, we are talking about uh, at least eleven aircraft and uh, three from uh, South Korea. Okay. And how does that delivery build? Well, the deliveries will start, you know, uh, in 24, 24, 30 months from the signing of the contract, more or less. That means 2025 20, uh, onwards. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. No, thank you for the questions. Thanks, Kai. Our next question comes from Miles Walden, Wolf Research. Thanks, good morning. Maybe to just follow up on Kai's last question, uh, Francisco, when you're at you know a cadence of I guess uh, three three per year, four per year on the KC390, what's the anticipated margin profile of defense? Well, I mean, the defense will be a yeah, higher single digit, closer to 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 two digits with uh, those uh, contracts. Okay. Okay, good. Um, I was hoping you could maybe dig a little bit deeper on the, the supply chain into 4Q. Are you seeing the same challenges on the commercial side as you are on the executive side, or are they, they different in nature? Are, are some of them large structures, or some of them engines, or some of them small piece parts? I'm just trying to understand if you're facing the exact same problem uh, on both sides, or if they're, if they're pretty unique. Well, uh, f first of all, I think it's important to mention that uh, we 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 have seen improvements in the supply chain from 22 to 23. 
in, in many in, in, with many suppliers but we still have uh, challenges uh, as you mentioned so they are they're not necessarily the same when we talk about the engines yes we have a uh, challenge in both sides but all the components are, are, are not the same but uh, I mean, we believe that uh, even with the challenges, I mean, we will be at the lower end of our guidance in terms of deliveries this year, Miles. Okay. Okay. And then one last one, um, the GTF issue and, and the accelerated um, inspection and, and replacement on their powdered metal. Can you comment um, as it relates to effects you're seeing on your, your E2 fleet or you expect on your E2 fleet? And then also with respect to AUGMA, what's the kind of revenue opportunity um, from the AUGMA MRO opportunity for the GTF? No, oh, absolutely. Well, first, I mean, there's no inspection planned for GTF uh, E2, E2 this year, 2023. Uh, Pratt Whitney announced recently that uh, the E2s will be less impacted because, you know, the aircraft uh, arrived uh, later in the market with a more mature configuration of the engines. And also the aircraft is, is uh, lighter than the, the other models. So this, uh, this puts the E2 in a, E2 is not, they are not uh, immune of the issues, but I put these E2s in a, in a, I'd say in a better situation in terms of uh, performance for, for our customers. And the product is still working in this inspection uh, uh, inspection schedule for for the E2s, you know, related to the powder uh, metal issue. Uh, the other question was uh, Agma and your opportunity. Uh, yes, okay. Revenue. Side. Agma is moving is moving very fast. I mean, uh, uh, in preparation for the SOP of the GTF engines that is planned for April 2024. And that is a, it's a very important contract for Ogma that will help Ogma to, to triple its revenues in the, you know, in the next two, two or three years. Very good. Thanks, Francisco. Thanks. You're enjoy. welcome. Smile. Our next question comes from Felipe Nielsen, City. Please proceed. Hi, guys. Uh, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Congrats on the results. Uh, I have two on my side. Uh, the first one, uh, if you're seeing any uh, relief uh, or possible uh, relief in terms of scope clauses in the U.S., uh, as you mentioned, uh, several campaigns going forward. Uh, and the second one is, uh, how do you expect to close the free, free cash flow gap uh, to reach the 2023 guidance that you gave? Like uh, I saw that you still have uh, cash burn for nine months, and you you maintain your guidance of free cash flow a generation of uh, 150 million. So, just wanted to hear your thoughts. Uh, how do you expect to get there? Thanks. Philippe, thanks for the question. First, uh, related to the scope clause, we we don't see any movements to change the to, no to for the relaxation of the scope clause. But uh, to be honest, we don't see really an impact for Embraer. So I mean, our one our E one seventy five E one is the you know is the workhorse of regional aviation in the U.S. And now with uh, with improvements, we are seeing the, the pilot situation. This will open the door for more sales of the EU 175 ones in the US. In parallel, we are working with the main lines in the US, you know, to to convince them to introduce the E2s, the E195 E2s, to complement the, the the big narrow bodies, you know, in order to offer you know higher frequency of flights to passengers in order to explore uh, new routes in a very attractive uh, cost benefit with the E195 uh, E2s. So related to the margin, now I ask Antonio to help here. Cash flow. Cash flow, yes. Felipe, good morning. 
Felipe, the cash flow, to be honest, is the, I would say, where we do see much more potential to be, to have some upside than downside. For sure, if you ask me today, you are negative, but uh, assuming that the 40% of the whole business is going to be done in Q4, we are going to deliver more than 2 billion in revenue and get the cash inflow and some of the those parts you are even not able to pay in advance that's why we do see a con more concentration on cash inflow in q4 and less cash outflows combined with the reduction of the inventories that's more or less where we do see the cash flow going and we also have m a that we just closed it was announced last friday with also a cash inflow of 45 million which helps this equation should be, uh, I would say, highly positive for the year. Thanks very much, guys. Our next question comes from Christian Lewis, Morgan Stanley. Hey, good morning, Antonio. Good morning, Francisco. Morning. Morning, Chris. You know, 4Q23, you know, 4Q is historically seasonally strong for deliveries. Um, so first, how is the supply chain executing for you to feel confident that you could deliver on your expected um, uh, customer deliveries in 4Q? And also, uh, looking at the midpoint of your 2023 EBIT uh, margin guide for the year, uh, 4Q would have to be around 9.6% in EBIT. So based on execution of what you've seen for, so far and availability of parts, how confident are you at meeting this? Okay, uh, Christine, I, I'll start with the deliveries in Q4. Then Antonio will complement with the, with the EBIT. I mean, we, 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 are, we have been working very, very closely to the, our suppliers in order you know, to, to mitigate the issues. We are getting the parts, but uh, we are getting some parts late. So this this puts uh, pressure on our production process, and not, not only production process, but uh, the, the delivery process as well, right? As uh, no, I mean, moving to the right, more to the December, and uh, that's a more difficult month. But we, we are still confident that uh, we will be at, uh, at the lower, lower end of our guidance in terms of delivery. And uh, even more confident that we'll, we'll deliver the financial results in the guides for the year. So, Antonio? So, Christine, good morning. Antonio speaking here. Thanks for the question. In regards to the, the BIT side, we, we do maths every single day, but one important point here, we are going to deliver, if you reach the low end of the guidance for the executive aviation, we are going to deliver more than 50 aircraft. And is there where we do see the highest the BIT come in together with the service side. And I would say uh, that's more or less what the margin should bring us. We are seeing today the BIT and a bit of the margin, the mid range of the guidance, to be more precise. Thank you. And then also taking a step back, um, you know, uh, Francisco and Antonio, the, the stabilization of the business after COVID-19 and, you know, after the breakup was going to, I mean, it's very clear that um, uh, the company is now in a harvest period. So with the balance sheet in a pretty strong place, with no significant um, maturities in the next few years, how do we think about capital deployment priorities for 2024 and beyond? So are you thinking of potentially another new airplane launch or is this a period where shareholders could get um, incremental return either through dividends or buybacks? How do you think about those uh, priorities? And maybe that's a more appropriate question for your investor day, but, but I thought, you know, I'll just uh, start off with that. Thanks, Christine. Good, uh, good, good question. So uh, that allows me to bring you even more information about that. Well, we, we, after everything we have done in the past years in terms of you know, restructuring the company, putting in place uh, initiatives to, you know, to, to foster sales, uh, also to improve efficiency 
and foster innovation in the organization. We believe now we are in our uh, harvest season, right? As the market is growing, and then we 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 enjoy this uh, this growth and uh, improve our operational and, and financial performance. So, combined with that, uh, we 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 have a, a very modern and competitive portfolio of products. In all the, the business units we, we act on, so the E2 family, you know, the, the Phenos, the Praetors, the C390, so that we are enjoying a very good momentum in terms of sales for all those uh, all those uh, segments. So what we want to do is, you know, in the is to focus, especially in 24 and 25, to focus on improving further our financial performance. We expect to 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 start to pay dividends in 2025 onwards. So and then uh, no, in parallel we are investing on developing new technologies to be prepared. You know by 2025 to decide what uh, what we're going to do going forward. So but remember that we are investing uh, on the EVTOL to develop the EVTOL together with EVE. We, we are also investing, as I said, in new technologies, you know, to prepare the, the studies of uh, future airplanes and also in the energy of family, you know, to explore uh, disruptive propulsion systems as, you know, electric hybrid, electric and uh, hydrogen hybrid. This is more or less the, our strategy going forward. You know, again, focus on in further improving the financial performance in 24, 25. I mean, continuing, I mean, selling the current portfolio of products and continue investing on uh, new technologies and innovation to prepare, you know, new new projects in the future. Great, thank you for the color and looking forward to seeing you guys in New York in uh, two weeks. Yeah, same from our side, see you there. Our next question comes from Ron Epstein, Bank of America. Hey, uh, good morning, guys. We've covered a lot on the call so far, but maybe if we just kind of go back, I think it was Noah who asked the question about campaigns. If we can dig down a little bit deeper on that, is there, is there any more color you can give us on that and, and how you're thinking you know, campaigns will, could, could go through the end of this year, maybe into next year, and and what that translates into into a like a, what's like a normalized delivery rate for the e jets? You know, when we think about you know building our models when we go out a couple of years, what should we think that the company can get to on on e jets from here? Yeah, hi, hi, uh, Rome. Again, thanks, thanks again for a question. I mean, uh, in terms of campaigns for commercial aviation, we, as I said before, we we are we are working in, in many different campaigns. You know, big names in different regions: I mean, Europe, Asia Pacific. Uh, uh, also, we are starting to offer the the E2s in the US as well. I think it's uh, it's becoming more and more clear that the E195 E2 is not only a regional, regional jet as, uh, as uh, the E19, E175 E wants, right? I mean, it's a, it's a bigger airplane that can help uh, a lot the, the airlines, you know, to operate very profitably in, in, in in routes with less passengers, as as for example, Azul is doing in Brazil, as KLM is doing in uh, in uh, in Europe, and you know, and uh, Scoot and SKS they have the same plans for for Asia. So we we and we believe that uh, more and more the airlines are understanding this, and uh, we 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 see a lot of good opportunities for the E tools. I mean, going forward in the market. So in terms of deliveries, Rome, you know, we have, uh, we still have a limitation with, with the engines, 
but uh, we 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 are confident that we combine e tools and the e ones we we will be you know at uh, at uh, above eight units in 2024 in reaching you know 100 units in 2025 and years ahead so again if if you go you know above 100 units 100 110 units we'll be basically back to the levels pre-pandemic levels but with a different mix now we have uh, much more e2s that you know it's more expensive so in terms of revenues we will see a uh, revenue we see a much higher revenue than uh, than in the past with the same uh, quantity of uh, of uh, delivered aircraft so it, this is more of the situation as your question i mean we are we are optimistic with the campaigns we are working on we are optimistic with the opportunity to introduce the e2s in the in the us as well by the way i mean very soon very soon the we will see the e195 e2s from porter flying to big cities in the us you know los angeles san francisco new york boston uh, uh, orlando miami and this will be a great uh, showcase of our aircraft that we believe people will love to fly in a in a very efficient aircraft without middle seats and this will open opportunities for that aircraft in, in north america and finalizing my comments you know with the uh, with improvement in the pilot shortage this also open opportunities for for renewing for the company to renew the fleet of the uh, e-ones which uh, uh no has more better margins it can help us with the performance of our commercial aviation and then going going forward are there opportunities to upgrade the e2 platform itself without having to do a new aircraft i mean it's it's a relatively new airplane anyway um are there are there ways to upgrade it that you could play with the engine or do other aerodynamic tweaks to the airplane to get more out of the platform well we, we are we continue to invest in the and improve the competitiveness of the e2s i mean with uh with improvements in in the aircraft we we are also you know you know we we are converting the u190 e1s into freighters so the first one has already a a the door installed and it looks very nice so we believe it's a it's a good opportunity for us to introduce this uh, cargo to help the commercial aviation as well so again these are things we we are doing and uh we believe, you know, that uh, going, I mean, above 80 units next year and uh, above 100 units from 2025 onwards, this will help a lot to improve the financial performance of commercial aviation as well. And the service will come, it will grow because of that as well, right? More aircraft, more service as well. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, thank Ron. You, Ron. Our next question comes from Marcelo Mota, JP Morgan. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Is a question regarding uh, next year. You know, the, the supply chain remains challenging, but uh, you mentioned that you can increase the level of deliveries on, on the commercial. So just wondering what will you see in terms of uh, the executive, the defense? I mean, do you think it could be growing again, uh, double digit rate on top line? You know, what will be the, the outlook for? the different lines of business of the company. Thank you. Well, Marcelo, uh, thank you. I mean, uh, yes, I mean, next year, we'll still be challenged in the supply chain and the, with specific parts, but again, improving from 2023 uh, situation. So we, we, we are growing. I mean, we are planning to grow double digits in uh in all business units we have so we are growing this year 23 compared to 22 we are going you know more than 20 percent and we expect to keep the same path i mean going to 2024 and uh also keeping important growth in uh, in the years ahead so and uh, and again we are working very closely with our supply our supply chain with our suppliers and to make sure that uh, we will have the parts we need you know, for 
you know, to support this growth. Also, what we want to do in 2024 is to, to improve the distribution of the production deliveries throughout the year. We have an initiative we call production leveling that I uh, know that we want to avoid this concentration of production in the second half of the year and see a, a, a better distribution throughout the year. It's still a challenge in the Q1 next year, but we are working very hard since now in order to improve uh, our production deliveries in 2024. Perfect, super clear. Thank you. Our next question comes from André Ferreira, Bradesco BBI. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you for, for taking my question. I have two questions. Uh, the first, I was wondering if you could give us an update on how the partnership with L3 Harris for the Agile Tanker is developing. And uh, the second question, uh, you mentioned in a in a previous question about the uh, the countries that are selecting the C three ninety, but if you could comment a bit on the on the potential talks with the with the Indian government a few months back, if you could give us a, a more a, a bit more detail on that. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Well, I mean. Uh... Partnership with L3 Harris uh, is, is moving. We, we, you know, we see the, the C390 a great uh, solution for the US Air Force. Uh, and, and the first opportunity we found was uh, the tanker, we call Agile Tanker. And this is, a, this is what this uh, partnership with L3 Harris is for, right? To, to work with the US Air Force you know, to offer the C-290 as an agile tanker. But we, we want also to offer the C-290 for the missions, right? I mean, so we are reinforcing our team in the U.S. as well. We recently announced a, a new vice president of sales for the U.S. to support uh, L3 and support the potential future sales of C-319, that country that is the biggest defense market in the world. So uh, the C-319, again, uh, other countries, I mean, we, we are very happy with the announcement uh, of Netherlands 2022, and now more recently, Austria and Czech Republic. I mean, that makes the, the C-319 the preferred solution for this multi-mission platform uh, for the NATO countries. So we expect to close those contracts, you know, in the, during the first half of uh, 2024. In India, you know, we are working in India now to select uh, a partner that will be our partner to localize the, the, the production, the assembling of the C390 to be compliant with, uh, with the specification of this uh, India Air Force. Né? They want to buy, you know, between 40 to eight uh, multi-mission aircraft, and we do believe that the C-390 is, uh, is the best solution for them. We want to be prepared to compete, and uh, for that we need to select a partner. This is the where we are in terms of uh, India, specifically for the C-319. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Noah Poponek, Goldman Sachs. Hey guys, the um, GTF services business that you're going to layer in, remind me how large that gets on an annual run rate basis once it's at its uh, run rate level. And then also what does the margin look like on that work? I know he's Antony speaking. I would say when the uh, project is mature, we are first seeing a revenue size of half a billion dollars for the uh, our company in, in, in Portugal. If was the right question to your the, to answer you, we do see in terms of size something like half a billion dollars. 
not next year. Next year will be uh, around 50, something like that, but the longer run, 500 million. Total company. Total company. Yeah. That, yeah, that starts, 20, when will that first start to hit your financials? Late next year? We started to already the repairs in April next year. Yeah, we, we have a ramp up curve. But we will see uh, some growth in Odmas revenue already in 2024, as Antonio said. But in 2025, we, we believe Odma will be close to $500 million uh, in terms of revenue and growing okay. in, in the years ahead as well. Okay. That's a, that's a bit of uh, positive collateral effect for the DGF issues. Okay. Just. And how does the margin on that revenue compare to the existing services segment margin? That's a uh, higher single digit, no. High single digit? It's, yeah, the same we have with other uh, OEMs like Rose, for example. Okay. And um, Antonio, I think I think last quarter you had guided to the defense segment having $600 million of revenue this year. Is that is that large of a fourth quarter still the plan? That's more or less what we we are expecting for sure. We need uh, one uh, campaign to be able to fulfill. I would say maybe we are going to lose 100 million, maybe, but it does not jeopardize our uh, ABIT margin. But we are just hanging one sales campaign that we hope to be close to end of this year because we do have some aircrafts and inventory, especially for the super tokens. That's more or less what I'm referring to. Okay. And then I, I guess, does, does the defense segment now just have, um, it, is it likely to have a pretty significant ramp up through the year in each year going forward? Or should I be thinking about the back half of this year being kind of the run rate moving forward? Or And then I guess you have a, maybe you have some airplanes slipping into next year, I guess. How do, how do you think next year compares to this year in defense uh, revenue? Next year, around 750, then moving uh, onwards to a billion on the longer range. Okay. With all of these new orders, for sure. No, we do have, a pot, I would say, a potential backlog of more than 2 billion with this contract that has been already announced. We needed to conclude them in order to put in the backlog, then we could have much more visibility in regards to the split between 24, 25, and 26. But I would say in the longer run, we do see defense around a billion revenue and higher single digit BIT market. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Noah. Thank you. We have a new question comes from Kai Von Rumor. G.B. Cohen, please proceed. Thanks so much. Uh, this will be uh, quick. So this is the first quarter in the last couple. I haven't heard any talk about selling uh, E2s to China. How do things look there? Okay, thanks for the question. Well, by the way, our, our team, commercial team, is in China now. We, we will have tomorrow a, a special event uh, to talk about uh, regional aviation in China, you know, to explore the connectivity and so on. So this is another movement of Embraer in China, you know, to show how effective could be the introduction of E2s for the for the regional aviation, complementing, you know, the the local the local aircraft. We are we are still working with uh, with. Uh, local airlines for the introduction of E2s and also uh, for potential partnerships. So this is what I can uh, can tell you at this point of time. Thank you. Thanks, Kai. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes today's question and answer session. The this concludes Embraer's audio conference for today. Thank you very much for your participation. Have a good day.